or when we feel uncomfortable, the idea that we should go see a psychiatrist and go get a diagnosis and treatment may not be the best and most optimal path to take. And I invite people to consider other pathways long before they do that, because the psychiatric field doesn't, maybe isn't the top line way to managing this level of discomfort and imbalance in our lives. What's the story behind a psychiatrist radically changing his career and becoming a transformational coach with the goal of helping others get in touch with their authentic selves, find their true voice, and heal their lives? Let's talk all about it with Dr. Fred Moss right here in episode 430 of The Nurse Keith Show. Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. This podcast is always about you and your personal and professional development, your career, and the healthcare system writ large. And I'm here to share education, ideas, frequent diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare and nursing, entrepreneurship, medicine, and beyond. I love having you along for the ride. And I thank you from the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And if you'd like to help other people find the show, you can do so by leaving a rating and review over on Apple, Google, Amazon, Spotify, or just share the show with anyone you like who you think might enjoy it or get something out of it. If you'd like to become a patron, I'd greatly appreciate that. Head over to Patreon, P-A-T, reon.com forward slash nurse Keith. I appreciate y'all so much. And you can go to nursekeith.com for the show notes, or of course, they're always in any app where you happen to be listening, where you can learn more about what was talked about on this episode and links to find our guest. As I said, we are here with the inimitable Dr. Fred Moss. And Fred, you and I had a great conversation a few weeks ago. You told me that you are a retiring, recovering psychiatrist, and now you are a transformational coach. And a lot more than that, I glean from all the stuff I've checked out of yours. So what does it mean to be especially a recovering psychiatrist? How would you define that? Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for having me on the show first. It's really a pleasure and an honor, and I really appreciate you and appreciate your listeners. And it's a real opportunity to talk a little bit about what does that mean to be a recovering psychiatrist. So, you know, with respect to recovering psychiatry, I went into psychiatry, frankly, because I really dis- had a massive distaste for psychiatry in the beginning. That's why I went in. If you might recall, I had actually dropped out of college a couple times and the second time I dropped out of college, my mom got me a um, uh, an application for a job to work at a state hospital for adolescent boys. And I began to work there and really enjoyed the communication I was having with these children, so-called children, seven or eight years younger than me, um, who had had some unfortunate, unfortunate circumstances in their life, I suppose. And that is where I really learned once and for all about the healing power of uh, communication and human connection as a source of all healing. I knew that every time I spoke with these kids, uh, we both healed. And I could see that we're all over the place, that that was the healing force that was really helping people way more than any kind of medication or actual diagnosis or the, any of the treatment that was really um, destined to happen as a result of being in a state hospital. But I didn't like the way psychiatry was dealing with these children because they were already using chemical and physical restraints as a way of managing untoward behaviors. And I just had to be part of it because I was a child care worker and just found it to be just barbaric and heden, you know, heinous. Hmm. So I went into the field so that I could actually bring communication into this field. I already knew that the field needed that. My brother, 14 years older than me, was already a psychiatrist and I had had Uh, some dabbling of psychiatry experience. But I really, really knew that what I wanted to do was be a communicator. And I knew that coming from that space of psychiatry, I could actually do so in a way that was maybe uh, unconventional or unheard of even, and (laughs) make a difference in the field. And that's why I went into the field. Now, when you start looking at what happened from 1980, which is when that occurred, all the way through, by 1987, we had the advent of, um, psych- of Prozac. Prozac changed things so drastically in the world of mental health. 
really causing the whole notion of this thing called biological psychiatry or chemical imbalance as a way of managing uncomfortable experiences in the world. And basically saying that if you were uncomfortable in the world, it was your fault or that you had some degree of abnormality or pathology. Now, I didn't agree with that even at the time, but I was typecast as a psychiatrist to be the one delivering this particular kind of medication. So when I graduated um, from medical school and then went into residency, I was already being groomed to be a psychopharmacologist. And it was frankly the last thing I wanted to do when I went into psychiatry. So there I was actually medicating all the people that came around and um, diagnosing them as well using (laughs) whatever level of diagnostic material was being used from the DSM-3 to DSM-4 and 5, often much against my better, uh, much against my better judgment. And this played out in eventually being a, a level of soul sacrifice, chronic sort of death by a thousand cuts um, until about 2006 when I began to actually make a difference. And that was, I began to take people off of their diagnosis and off of their medication and actually be re- began to relate to them like maybe there was nothing wrong with them. And I had tremendous success by doing that. People often lost their entire diagnosis um, as a result of coming off the medications that they thought might be sustaining them. And so over time, this has led to, um, you know, in the 10 years between 2006 and 2016, me working as a, a traveling doctor all around the United States and the world. And then 2016, we got to Welcome to Humanity. Welcome to Humanity was the brand I created to kind of like self-explanatory that all of humanity and all of our human experiences are exquisite in their, in their nature just by being what they are, including the uncomfortable ones. And that's when I really, again, began to really emphasize and amplify the notion that what is at the heart of all healing of all conditions, frankly, not just mental health, but I'm equipped to manage mental health is communication and human connection. So as a result of that, I became a podcaster. I wrote a couple of books, um, The Creative Eight and uh, Find Your True Voice. And I created a couple of courses, The True Voice Course and um, Healing the Healer all of which are really focused on helping people get to their core self so that when they do communicate with another, they're not pretending to be anybody else but themselves. They're no longer fearful and they are stepping into their truest self, their core value self, their honest to goodness, genuine, authentic self, and bringing that forth so that they can, in fact, both be healed and heal. Um, And uh, that's really how I eventually took on this idea of being a recovering and retiring psychiatrist, because a psychiatrist is really no, if I ask you, what's the difference between a psychiatrist and and any kind of other field, you might say that um, that a psychiatrist is the one who uh, prescribes medication. And we had been typecast to that level. So I no longer could live with myself being that as my primary goal in the world and began to really step out of the field conventionally and become a transformational restorative coach instead, helping people find their truest voice, helping people deliver that truest voice into a world that was eager to receive it, and helping people see that it is precisely that level of communication that is what's necessary in order to bring healing to the world. So yes, indeed, I am a recovering and retiring psychiatrist here in my 65th year on the planet. Wow. That's that is a lot to unpack there. And you you mentioned on our first call when you and I were having a chat that you were taking people off of medicine, like you said, you moved in the direction of relational medicine because you we saw that relationships, communication, open heartedness, <clears throat> authenticity, and helping people through your like your voice, like coming to them as a human, human to human. And you talked about undiagnosing, unmedicating, and undoctrinating. So that speaks volumes to where you've come since you first were a fresh-faced young psychiatrist who wanted to change things. And then all of a sudden you found yourself in that system. And a lot of the listeners of this podcast are nurses who 
obviously, if you ask someone why they become a nurse, I would say more than nine out of 10 will tell you because they want to help people. Exactly. Right. Yep. So people want to become nurses. They, I always say they don't go into it for the the awesome outfits, no. the sexy shoes, and the great salaries and accessories. Not at we all. go into it for other reasons. So what is it about people who do this frontline work, like nurses, for instance, where they can't necessarily approach their patients with the, the heartfelt authenticity that they would like to right and how do they get to that place very interesting question so you know that's that you know my most recent passion and you sort of tap on this is this idea of healing the healer and my my podcast is now called the healthy healer my newest podcast and so we're really aiming at those of us who went into the field with uh, you know dreams or ideas or um, acknowledgement of our gifts and blessings of being able and wanting to help people with what we had already. That's why any of us chosen to become nurses or social workers or clinical um, assistants in the world of healing. No one really goes into the world of healing for the money that you're going to make or for the stature or anything like that. Ultimately, what you do is you go in because you have these gifts and you're pretty sure that you can help people just by being you. You've already helped people outside of the clinical, uh, the proper clinical world. You've helped your friends or your family or, or your or your children or your parents. And you're now at a space where um, you, you're pretty positive that you have the goods to be someone who can make a difference. What has happened over time is that the field has been... Um, really uh, corrupted in many different ways. Whether you want to call it money or you want to call it other agendas, it doesn't really matter. But we all know that our mental health system and our health system in general is very sick. And in that it is very sick, we can see that um, we are being asked as healers to not really be, bring our best self forward. We're, we're being asked to pretend in many cases that we are bringing our best self forward. So being friendly by actually speaking untruths to people. So be very kind and being very friendly and then saying things that are no longer aligned with your core self. This is happening on the nursing level as well as the doctor level. And oftentimes, nurses are actually telling their patients things that even they don't believe. Now, this is when you really start getting absurd. When we as humans start saying things that even we don't believe, it has reached a new level of preposterousness. This is something that we're not even lying anymore. We actually know that what we're saying is not true. And we are saying it as if we're representing ourselves, as if we really agree with what we're saying, when in fact, we don't even agree with what we're saying. So the field has really gone to that where we spend our whole day doing things many times as nurses or other practitioners doing things that are misaligned with our core self and having that be our way of getting through the day, surviving the day and pretending to be in many cases that which we wish we were. But if we were to really act as Florence Nightingale invited us to do or as William Osler or Hippocrates invited us to do we would do and say different things. We would actually be healers at levels that the field doesn't necessarily promote. So in the world of undoctoring, which is the moniker that I was affectionately given by a good friend of mine, the idea of being of undiagnosing, unmedicating, and undoctrinating became sort of a... Um, you know, a counter to this, this idea that I could that diagnosing maybe really wasn't helping clients from a mental health perspective. And certainly medications more often than not weren't helping clients in a way that I knew I could alone. And therefore, undiagnosing, unmedicating, and then, you know, the cute term of undoctrinating people, uh, getting them out of the system that was actually perpetuating, increasing, or even in times causing the symptoms they marketed to treat. Mm -hmm. And what you were talking about there for a second, a couple of minutes ago, where people are saying and doing things that they know they don't even believe in anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. I, 
in a sense for me, that's like value misalignment. Like yeah. we're, we're working in a way that's counter to our values. And when I work with my clients, we often talk about values. And a lot of people come to me actually for exactly the reason you described. Right. That it's not why they went into it in the first place and they feel very disillusioned. Sometimes it takes a few years for them to get there. Sometimes they feel it right away. Sometimes yeah. they experience it during their education. Exactly. But they're already on the train, you know? Right. So there are a lot of alternatives for people in terms of career, but it can also be hard to go out on your own. How how have colleagues responded to your your journey? Like what what kind of feedback have you gotten from colleagues who have watched your own transformation? Right. So colleagues, those who stay in the field doing what they're doing, are still drinking the Kool-Aid after all. Mm -hmm. They're doing it and they are self-assured that they're doing it. They're self-righteously doing it pretty positive that the, or at least pretending or wanting or hanging on to being positive that the rhetoric that they're, um, that they're uh, um, stating is consistent with their core self. So it's not real clear that they're behind what I'm doing because it's a direct affront to them. If I say that, doing psychiatry the way psychiatry is conventionally done to somebody who is committed to being a psychiatrist, um, that can be a direct, uh, a, a direct affront to them. So I don't get, you know, if you're talking about colleagues in the form of um, professional colleagues like psychiatry, mm -hmm. uh, they're the last ones to come aboard here. On the other hand, what I'm saying is so inherently sensible that most of them are willing, if they're willing to let their hair down a little bit and take off a hat or two, um, they can see that what I'm saying isn't very far from being true. And I'm not really asking anything. And by the way, for your clients and for your uh, listeners, any of them who are presently taking medication or have a psychiatric diagnosis that they feel is working for them, you know, that they feel that the medication regimen or the treatment regimen is actually helping them live a better life, the, as good a life as they could ever hope for. This by no means is a suggestion that what they're doing is wrong. They should keep doing exactly what they're doing. Anytime you find a key to the lock of life in the idea that you can actually step into you know, what you're doing and make a positive difference such that your life is actually working out, you should do that. It's, this is a crazy world. And if you have found some formula that has actually given you a life that works, and that includes psychiatric diagnosis and medication, and you don't want to shift from that, by all means, please don't shift from that. Who I'm really speaking to, um, Keith, is the hundreds of millions of people who fall outside of that range. People who've been told that there's such thing as diagnosis or that they have a diagnosis and that these particular treatments or medication regimens um, are the best and only way to manage that diagnosis. When in fact, those treatments are not proven to be the best. And really what we want more than anything as human beings, and I think this has proven over the years and over the decades and centuries and millennia over time, is we want to be heard. We want to connect to people. That's what we want. And what you and I both know that when we connect with our clients or our friends or our colleagues or our family, that is when healing occurs. That is when that sweet harmonic resonance of healing occurs. So I'm not saying anything that's very controversial uh, automatic, you know, uh, uh, ostensibly. Mm -hmm. I'm really just saying things that we all know. And then, indeed, I am po poking a hole or two and poking the bear of the properness of using psychiatry as a way of managing mental health uncomfortableness. Or when we feel uncomfortable, the idea that we should go see a psychiatrist and go get a diagnosis and treatment may not be the best and most optimal path to take. And I invite people to consider other pathways long before they do that, because the psychiatric field doesn't maybe isn't a top line way to managing this level of discomfort and imbalance in our lives. Mm. Well, before we take a break, and that's very well said, Fred, is in our culture, in our society in the 21st century, the pace at which it moves, the the kind of like sound bite quality of social media and communication these days, it sounds like to me that what you're talking about, and that I wholly believe in, by the way, is that we have to slow down enough to actually be able to 
feel what's in our heart and communicate it and also take the time to listen. And where <laughs> I don't even know how to ask this question. Where do we turn when we want that kind of life, when we want to work in that particular way? If we are healers or believe ourselves to be or want to be healers, or we're people who want to be healed, um, where are the settings and milieus where that can happen? Yeah, well, they actually happen outside of the framework of the clinics and the hospitals in our world. Oh, they don't frequently yeah. happen inside the framework. And that really, what that really begs is this idea that we're all healers. And you really touched on what is the what I call, even in the True Voice methodology, when I'm teaching people how to be podcasters, or in my book, the Find Your True Voice book, which is available to your listeners just for the price of shipping and handling uh, at findyourtruevoicebook.com is that the key ingredient to having a true voice is indeed listening. That's what's called for more than anything if you're going to create a true voice. So creating the uh, playground for uh, proper communication and connection, the number one and most important prerequisite ingredient is listening for what is seeking to emerge and then delivering your voice in whatever self-expressed way you do so in order to move that needle forward in a direction uh, for which the conversation is seeking to seeking to um, uh, proceed in. Mm -hmm. And so some of us do that in our friendships or exactly. our families, but many of us want to be able to do that in our professional work yeah. as well, right? Absolutely. So, you know, that's just food for thought for nurses who feel like, ah, oh, I really want to be able to, you know, really talk and really listen. And we have to find pretty special places where we can do that as professionals or create our own, create our own work where exactly. clients come to us. Right. And isn't that ultimately the grand tragedy of being a healer in the present Western world is that we have to find a special space to actually use our God-given skills to bring mm -hmm. our blessings and give forward to the people that we want to help that we have to actually find a little corner for which we won't get in trouble or won't get fired or won't get dismissed or d disregarded um, in order to actually speak what we already know is our harmonic resonating self that has us be healers in the first place. That is the grand tragedy of our present present healing world. The, the tragedy and irony, right? Exactly. That to be the kind of healer some of us want to be, we have to like, go off somewhere else to do that because yeah. we're afraid we're going to get into trouble. Exactly. Yeah. Or That's, cause trouble. Or yeah. cause trouble. Yeah. But sometimes causing trouble is the, the key, isn't it? <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And you're, you're not one to shy away from doing things differently and talking about it. Right. So when we come back from the break, I'd like to talk about a whole bunch of things. I definitely want to touch on the work that you do and this whole notion of the true voice methodology and what, what does true voice really mean to you? And I also want to talk about that whole notion of bringing your authentic message to the world and the ways in which you found avenues to be able to do that. I'd like to dive into that a little more. Does that sound like a good idea? Sounds perfect. Yep. Okay, so hang in there with us. We'll be right back with Dr. Fred Moss right here on episode 430 of The Nurse Keith Show. Stay tuned for part two. Hey, everyone. Let's take a quick pause for the cause, shall we? If you're in need of personalized holistic career coaching to elevate your nursing and healthcare career, look no further than NurseKeith.com and NurseKeith Coaching. I can help you with your job search and interview strategies, resume and cover letter optimization, LinkedIn maximization, and envisioning the future of your career. I can also support you in launching your own business, learning how to write and blog as a side hustle, or launch your own podcast. And please note that you can receive 10% off your first coaching package if you mention the show. So email me at keith at nursekeith.com to schedule a complimentary 30-minute strategy session. Now, let's get back to the episode at hand. Hey. 
And welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again with friend of the pod and my new friend and colleague, Dr. Fred Moss. And Fred, it's so wonderful to have you here and have a chance to have my audience hear what you have to say. And the first thing I wanted to mention and to ask was that not that long ago, you survived open heart surgery. And you told me when we spoke that it gave you a real opportunity to experience something really profound and special in your life. So what what was that about for you? Yeah, so actually it was uh, three months to the day, 12 weeks to the day today. And um, the idea was that I was exercising not more than 10 feet from where I am right now. And I was doing some stretching and um, I felt a sort of a pop of some sort. And then um, my my uh, trainer was on the computer in front of me and he's like, Fred, did you just have a cramp? I'm like, no, dude, that's no flipping cramp. And he's like, what is it? And I say, it's my heart. And uh, I knew it was my heart. It was pretty obvious. And, you know, I had uh, experience. He said, well, go get your wife. And so I went in and got my wife. And the last thing, the last three numbers I would ever dial on the phone for, and I think I've already made it clear would ever be would be 911. I had no intention of ever dialing 911 for any reason. But there I was having self diagnosed with a dissecting ruptured aortic aneurysm. And the whole idea was I have two choices at this moment. And I knew that. And those two choices was to call 911 or just perish. That's the end. Mm -hmm. And so I I thought about it for just a second, looked up at my beautiful wife and said, let's just go with 911. She knew that I had two choices. And we called 911. They showed up here in a few minutes and put me in a truck and drove me to the local area, which didn't have a big enough facility to deal with me. And they had to do all the, their magic. And really, to tell you the truth, Keith, the system responded, of course, gorgeously, amazingly, like beautifully. And before too long, they found me a bed in um, Sacramento, 50 miles away. Dr. Victor Rodriguez, who I truly owe my life to, was waiting for me so that he could put his knife into my chest and cut my sternum in half and give me the open heart surgery that I needed. He and I had a beautiful conversation where I said, what's we looking at here? And he said, we're looking at 40% mortality in good hands. I'm like, dude, that's too big. That's Mm -hmm. big numbers. I don't need that. I don't want to be your 40%. And I also don't want to be your 60%. I'm up to some big stuff in the world and I need you to help me stay here. And he said, I'm not going to heal you. Your attitude is going to heal you. I said, well, let's rock this thing. And we went forward with the open heart surgery. And I, I won't tell you that I've had a great attitude the whole time, but here I am 12 weeks later walking around and pretty fairly healed. I've had some great care from my wife who takes beautiful care of me as well as an acupuncturist and um, recently had an actual echo that was clean and green where he told me I don't have to have another one for a year. And my Dacron um, bypass that's at the top of my surgery that's at the top of my aorta connected to the root of my heart is still working beautifully. And my should have been tricuspid valve that was bicuspid is now properly tricuspid. And, uh, you know, my blood pressure this morning is 124 over 72, which is way lower than it had been for most of my life leading up to the incident. And uh, so I'm living a low blood pressure lifestyle. And when you talk about that, I know that I'm speaking a little bit slower and a little bit less agitated and violent than I had been beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a certain amount of violence that comes with, you know, rejecting your primary um, mothership field. And I have lost some of that. And now I feel like I'm much more conversational and understanding of the whole thing. And the whole idea of welcome to humanity makes sense to me at a greater level. So The opportunity that exists here is the opportunity of having recovered from an NDE, a near-death experience, but more than that, to actually step forward. I'm obviously asked that, you know, the powers that be are obviously asking me to bring something forward from this day forward, from this day moving on. And that's uh, that's part of who I get to be is I get to be Dr. Fred, the, the maybe the ambassador for life optimization or the ambassador for bringing true voice forward. That's really beautiful. It's a great story. It's transformation. And you you decided to trust the system that you had developed great mistrust in. And you and I can both admit that there are certain things for which Western medicine is very well made for, which is repairing a, a dissecting aorta, 
or yeah, for sure. you know, intervening during a stroke, you know, right. all, all those are, or certain types of care like cancer, there are certain things that need to happen. And there's someone I'm going to introduce you to sometime soon, my friend, Dr. Jonathan Fisher, he is, um, he's known as the happy heart MD. And he's just publishing a book called Just One Heart, A Cardiologist's Guide to Healing, Healthy, and Happiness. And the last time he was on my show, we talked about the connection between the energetic heart and the physical exactly. heart. And I think yeah. you two could have a really interesting conversation. Right. And I think you you would be very much aligned with, with what he has to say. And now that you've been through this experience and... I would think that you're you're probably even more deeply dedicated to this notion of like bringing your authentic message to the world, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think you know when I look at it energetically and I've read a little bit of Dean Ornish as well, so there's other folks who have spoken to this notion. Mhm of heart disease. This is not my heart that was diseased, by the way. It was the big highway leading from my heart, the aorta. So my heart is, uh, has and always remains, it has remained in great shape. And the idea is uh, like the, I think the duplicitous nature of my life and sending like two streams of my heart down into the highway known as the aorta is part of what energetically led to my aorta being weakened, I'm pretty sure. So you can make an energetic um, explanation without working too hard that that's what was happening beforehand. And that's what stressed the whole walls of the aorta, like the traffic jam that was there with A and B getting um, sent down there inconsistent with each other and being forced to actually inter, uh, mingle with each other in, in the pathway out of my heart to my body. So I'd be glad to speak uh, to your friend and um, to anybody else about what it really means to be inside of your heart. What does it really mean to be consistent? And you're right. It has offered me, a, I think, a greater sense of the obviousness that being aligned with oneself brings to not only others, because once you're that, you can be the resonating tuning fork that they're looking for, but to ourselves as well. That authentic delivery, genuine delivery of who we really are is what we came here to be. As children, we never would have thought of trying to be somebody different than they are, than we are in order to protect the person that we actually are. Um, and uh, we've learned that over time and the crack in the cement has got larger without us repairing it. So this whole idea of, you know, the literally ludicrous notion of trying to be someone we're not in order to protect the person we are um, no longer fits and never did fit. It's not a natural way to be a human. The natural way to be a human is to speak and honestly deliver that which matters to you in a way that makes sense and moves the conversation forward. Mm -hmm. And when we're physicians, for instance, and we're working in primary care, or maybe often many specialties too, maybe even psychiatry, aren't we often limited to like 15 minutes to talk to a patient? Fifteen. Wow. Yeah. You're so, still working in the old school. Well, I'm not in it, but I'm just observing. My, and, mostly six, six to eight oh, minutes. Oh, oh, six to eight minutes. Okay. Yeah. I was being way too generous. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is that doing to our humanity, both the well, patient and the practitioner? Again, it's just washing it down. It's making it so artificial. There's nothing, you know, my, I'm in a hurry the minute I walk into the room and you know it. I'm walking mm -hmm. into the room and I, the last thing I might ask you, how are things? Are you having any symptoms? How's your depression? How's your mom? Uh, do, you know, I understand your child was, uh, you know, recently diagnosed with a broken leg. How is they doing? How's your, you know, how's this or that? I might be able to ask some cursory questions, but in a reality here, the goal is not to connect with the clients anymore or to, it is maybe to dig deep fast and get to a place that seems like connection. Like, Oh boy, he remembered that my child had a broken leg. He must be a really astute doctor hmm. rather than really getting to the core of what human connection is about. Now, that, it, you know, it isn't a matter of how many minutes you have, but one can ascertain without working too hard that 15 minutes isn't really long enough to dig into knowing somebody and then be able to wash themselves out. Now, we have already done, for instance, we are our first half of this segment was something like 15 or 17 minutes. 
and uh, we can we went pretty far deep into an intimate conversation. So you can do that, but you can't leave a room like that. I can't just get there and then be on my way out and make sure that my charting is done and that I've addressed your diagnosis and your medication refills and your interdisciplinary therapies and all. So we're always in a hurry and we do not, we no longer are placing the proper level of emphasis, even though we think we, we are at least paying lip service to it, the proper level of emphasis on human connection, which I believe, as I said, very real and very, very wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly indeed, that um, is it's at the, core, at the core of all healing of all conditions of all types in all fields. Mm. Yeah, and, and in that, that press of time, we have inserted um, EMRs, yeah. EHRs, yeah. and now more than ever, and at an accelerating pace, we're inserting AI yeah. and all the different ways in which we are now interacting with AI, even though none of us ever asked for any of this, by the way. <laughs> right. What is happening What's your diagnosis, doctor, of how that is affecting humanity? Well, that's a difficult question. So it doesn't really, I think my first answer to this is that it doesn't, no one really cares what my opinion is about this. My mm. diagnosis of this isn't very important because it's coming anyways. And it's, it's almost like, what's my, what's my diagnosis of a tsunami coming, mm-hmm. not coming onto, onto our land? What's my diagnosis of a here and coming hurricane? You know, what do I think about a hurricane? What do I think about a, a tornado? Or what do I think about a forest fire? And that's what we're talking about. We're actually talking about the level, not we're, we're birthing a new species here. This is not something that's like the internet or even a telephone. This is something like the discovery of fire. And the impact that this is about to have on humanity and our interactions with each other is so overwhelming that none of us can, no one person can really fathom what is really about to occur. The idea that artificial intelligence or that even, you know, the small bit of artificial intelligence that has eked its way into our, um, into our uh, like EHRs and EMRs isn't anything compared to what we're talking about. The idea that doctors could be replaced in the next few years altogether becomes very real and nurses for that matter, by Mm -hmm. robots who no longer need any um, time off or extra pay or, um, you know, need to be given maternity leave or anything like that. Like these things, these machines will know everything that we have ever learned and be able to spit it out and provide, in many cases, um, uh, care that exceeds, that actually exceeds, at least um, content-wise, the care that would otherwise be given by an average human. Now, the thing that it does not replace, it just simply cannot and won't, is this idea of the human connection, the essence of the human connection. So I believe that whole notion, I get to stick on that. I get to you know, stay hands down with that AI and um, any type of you know, virtual realities that are coming around the corner will not be able to to gently and entirely replace that which is at the essence of our healing, which is the, our love and our addiction and our, our true and honest, um, uh, we'll say, um, full dependency, life dependency on human connection at the source of our healing. Mm. And that's where a lot of your work comes in. So we have your course that's about healing through creativity and self-expression, which is a very, or can be a very powerful avenue to learn about ourselves. And then you have the True Voice methodology and you have your podcast and all the other things that you offer. So first let's start with creativity and self-expression. So what is what is cre- Creative 8 about? I have looked it over because you sent me a link, but tell us a little bit about that and why do you see creativity and self-expression as one of those keys that can unlock particular doors? Right. So what I noticed over time before writing that book, and there, just to be clarified, there's no course about the Creative 8 that's more or less a book. Mm-hmm. And the book itself is called Creative 8 Healing Through Creativity and Self-Expression. 
And what it looks at is that while we're in the act of being creative in the form of other alternative forms of self-expression beyond vocality, such as art, music, dancing, singing, drama, cooking, writing, and gardening, when we're doing those things, our imbalances or our discomforts tend to entirely disappear during the act. And when I noticed that, I really realized the possibility that maybe all of our imbalances and all of our discomforts in our psychological world are actually uh, indicators of a deficiency in our capacity to both self-express and listen to others. So when I say art, I am talking about creating art rather than going to an art museum. Art museum is a receipt of art and that has its value, but in the real truth of it all, it is in the creation of art or the creation of music, even if you're just tapping a pen on your table or the creation of dancing or singing or writing, for which this magic occurs. And that is the creativity actually alleviates and entirely eliminates the symptoms that you thought you were having that you were ready to call psychological or maybe in need of some form of professional intervention. So when I have people do in this creative aid is actually tap into a little bit of their creativity and realize how beautiful it is that creativity in and of itself is a more potent medication than any medication that's ever come from a laboratory. Mm, wow. And when we talk about self-expression, that can come in a lot of forms, right? And mm -hmm. you're a you're a big proponent of podcasts and podcasting and the the power of the the spoken word, the spoken voice. Mm -hmm. So what is what is the whole notion for you about the true voice and the the methodology that you've developed around that and what you like to communicate to other people. Right. So in both, thanks for asking. So in both cases, the Find Your True Voice book and in the True Voice course, I uh, point to a methodology that I've developed that is now time tested. And I've helped about 60 people go from zero to podcaster in that course. And the idea being that Podcasting is probably the most po most uh, powerful platform at this point to not only voice our own honest to goodness, true and honest, true and genuine self like we're doing here today, but to own it and to have access to it and to point it to the crowd that is ready to listen, to actually head it towards the audience that is eager to hear what needs to be said. So in the vocality and the exchanges that happen in True Voice, what we do is we wash away the mud or the rust or the cobwebs that are in the way of rediscovering our truest self, which has been here the whole time. And we start getting people back to in really back to their own basic self, that self that you already know exists, that's being maligned each and every day. And then we give exercises so that those um, so that those findings can be utilized effectively, effectively in our real world incrementally. So incremental changes with the people that we love or with neighbors or with bosses or with colleagues or with coworkers or with the shop owners. And we, what we do is we give people exercises and practices to bring that forward so that communication becomes purer again. And we head more deeply towards that resonating um, tuning fork that we are. And then once we get that, we start realizing again that that is so addicting, that is so compelling that we have no interest from switching to that because ultimately authenticity will trump acceptance uh, and agreement. I'm sorry, authenticity will trump agreement all day long. Mm -hmm. We sometimes think that we're not causing trouble because we're simply agreeing with someone, but people know when we're not being authentic. And what we really want to do is be authentic with each other. I don't know if you notice, but when people are saying things that are that are diametrically opposed to what I might say content-wise, but are saying things from an authentic space of their true heart, I actually not only can tolerate them, but I'm actually interested in what they have to say, even though it's entirely different. However, when people agree with me just because they don't want to make a fuss, I can feel that too, and I disregard that level of agreement. Hmm. So we're really after authenticity. That's really what we as humans are looking for, and most of us are pretty good authentic authenticity police to make sure that what we're getting is coming from an authentic space. Mm, it's sort of like your authenticity detector, right? Exactly. Your, yeah. Your radar. And so being authentic can 
benefit us on every level, right? As parents, as partners, as healers, as nurses and doctors. And you have a, a course and a mastermind that really targets healers and it's called Healing the Healer. So what is that about and what are what are these healers who decide to work with you or take your course? What are they trying to heal in general? Exactly. So I have two courses and that is the more specialized of the two. We have the True Voice course, of course, that is for everybody. Um, but the Healing the Healer course is aimed specifically at healers who have become disenchanted. Healers that are aware that they're no longer resonating. The same healers we spoke about before, the nurses who are not speaking out loud anymore, the social workers who are not saying what they know to be true to their clients, the doctors who are no longer being the healers that they went into the field to be, and they know it each and every day that they have now just have a mundane job of punching in in the morning, making it through the day so they can come home and maybe have a drink or two and uh, dinner and, and catch some TV before they go to sleep and wake up and do the same stuff tomorrow. So this group of unresonating, non-harmonic folks who are now disenchanted with their course of life is what this what the Healing the Healer course is aimed at. And the Healing the Healer course is an extension of some coaching that I do. I also do one-to-one coaching with um, uh, clients who are interested in that. Um, but if you're not ready for one-to-one coaching, the course itself is a job that it came from essentially channeling, I'd have to say. It's almost like when I've done this course, I am amazed at the value of it. It sort of came through me rather than designed by me. And it really helps healers get in touch with why they went into the field with the first place and refine and redesign and recreate themselves as being the healers that they are. And then decide whether they're going to go back into the field and find their place where they can express themselves or perhaps even leave the field and become the barista that they needed to be in order to be a healer. Because after all, baristas do a fair amount of of healing as well, as you can tell from your favorite Starbucks barista. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's plenty of places in the world where we can have an effect on others and it's our, it's, we can choose how we do that and where we do that, right? The exactly. Where we do that. And if people want to find you, I know they go to welcome to humanity.net. That's one of the places where they can find you. And we'll have links to all your social media um, platforms, but where do they find your podcast? So the podcast is uh, on uh, Spotify and Apple. That's, uh, you know, you and all the regular sites that you named for yours as well. Um, you can find the healthy healer there. And um, then there was an older podcast that is presently dormant from the Welcome to Humanity that I really appreciate. Uh, nearly 100 episodes that I've had there is another place to find my uh, podcast. And then I've been a guest on, I think, over 100 shows. So you can find me as a guest where I speak even more openly as a guest than I do as a host. Right. Um, And then ultimately where I want to send people is to what is my new and up and coming um, uh, sort of virtual business card that's extraordinary. And that's called drfred360.com. So that's drfred360.com. And by July, when this is out, uh, that will be entirely well built up and will show you all all the things that I'm up to at any various time and give you access to how to get a hold of me or how to become part of any of those particular activities. Awesome. DrFred360.com. Okay. Yes, sir. Now, Fred, before we close, I have four quick questions I like to ask all my guests. So you game sure. for a little lightning round? Yeah, yeah let's go. Okay. Yep. So the first question is, how do you define success either personally and or professionally? Yeah, success is, uh, I would say, is being prepared for what's coming around the corner. Like mm-hmm. actually actually being able, maybe not prepared, but being able to manage and handle and maybe even thrive with most of the things that are unforeseen that are coming around the corner. Because after all, none of us are really very good at predicting the future. And right around the corner, here comes the next uh, challenge. And success is being able to utilize resources so that um, you can roll with the punches of what's coming around the corner. Mm, I love that. Okay. Second question. Could you name or just describe a person who's inspired you in the course of your life? They could be living or dead, famous, or someone none of us have ever, ever heard of before. Yeah. 
So I like to, if I had to pick a physician, I would pick both Hippocrates, Maimonides, and Hanneman. I think mm. all three of those are really interesting physicians. They all were world changers in and of their own right, and I love them all. Um, you know, Hanneman is most recently, of course, as the father of homeopathy. Maimonides was mostly mostly a truly truly ridiculously terrific human being, and Hippocrates, which really started the whole healing arts. Um, if I stayed away from medicine, there's others. There's certainly like, um, you know, Michael Jordan had a big impact on me. Bruce Springsteen had a big impact on me. David Letterman had a big impact mm. on me. And all of these people um, really, really have uh, affected and altered the way Tiger Woods also had a big impact on me. Mm. All these people had a major impact on who I've become. Wow. That's quite a list. Okay. Um, all right. Penultimate question is, is there a book or a movie, doesn't have to be an absolute favorite, but just one that comes to mind that's had an impact on the way you think, the way you live your life, the way you approach your work, any aspect of your life at all? Well, you know, I think there's some books out there like the Torah or um, Napoleon Hill's book, you know, Think and Grow Rich, that most people, I'm sure more, more than one person has answered this question with before. And um, if there's a movie, the, the surprising answer to that, I really loved Pulp Fiction when it came out. And I, I, but the movie that mostly hit me in the last few years is The Joker, the actual, uh, hmm. you know, the, the most recent version of The Joker. I thought that to be um, just a, a, a tremendous piece of work about the essence of the corrupt human nature. And huh. what is coming around the corner, like the prognostication of what we're really doing, including the masks, of course, and everything else that happened in that particular movie. Totally frightening movie, but it hit to the core at a level that no movie that I had ever seen hit me. So I love that movie. Wow, really interesting. I've never seen it. And um, that's you need to see it. It's just ridiculous. Interesting. OK, thank you. Yeah. And last question. If you, Dr. Fred Moss, were named king of the world tomorrow, king of the world, oh boy, what's one of the first things you'd want to do to improve the lives of your subjects? Bearing in mind that as king of the world, you have ultimate power. So this would just be your your first act. The first act to what would be my intention? Better improving the lives of your subjects. Yeah, I think it would be to introduce them to the queen of the world, would be my wife, Alexandra. Oh, that is really that is a beautiful answer. I love that. I love that. You yeah. um you said in your bio about her, you said that you're married to your dream partner. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, all, you live in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas in Northern California. So just really briefly, since you brought her up, what makes her your dream partner? Well, we actually met each other in a kind of a uh, unconventional way. We really, we had never met anybody in our world uh, simultaneously that irritated us more than the other person. Hmm. And we've grown from there. And the idea was, what is, why is it that you irritate me so much? What part of us is not working for me? And what we eventually got to is that in order to have a relationship, we would have to create 100% authentic and genuine selves with each other and really bring that each and every day, despite the problems and the challenges of what it means to be human. We do that. I do that. I, up until now, I've been in many different relationships prior to Alex, but up until most of them, I have been giving maybe 20 or 25% of my various self just to like meet the perceived needs of, our, of my partner and have that work. And eventually the other 75% would come flooding in and ruin the relationship. Mm -hmm. But in this case, what we have is, is something I think it's, rivaling 90 plus percent of my authentic self comes out in my work with Alex and my playing with Alex and my loving with Alex. And we really uh, are able to dance a dance that's entirely different than anything I'd ever experienced in the world of authenticity and genuineness. Then we have our three cats, which are also on the bottom of my uh, bio as well. And the three cats are um, Desposito and Winston and Valentino, who are assisting us in really... Um, uh, homeschooling us every day on what it really means to be uh, alive and well. That's right. And in your bio, you say that you and Alexandra are collectively owned by Valentino, Despacito, and Winston. So that's I, right. For sure. I hear you on that. Well, Fred, this has been really delightful. I encourage people to go to drfred360.com or to welcome to humanity.net. They can check out all your links to your socials and check out your podcast. So 
I really appreciate that you reached out to me and it's been totally delightful and inspiring to have you here today. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. You're a great interviewer, a great conversationalist, and thanks for tapping on some not so easy issues and getting you know, getting us to discuss some of the things that I think most of our nursing and healing uh, friends and colleagues can relate to. And that's the whole point. Thanks, Dr. Fred. You're welcome. All right. Thanks. And um, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nurse Keith Show. The show notes will be at nursekeith.com or actually in any app where you happen to be listening. If you need personalized holistic career coaching, look no further than nursekeith.com and Nurse Keith Coaching. Mention the show and get 10% off your first coaching package. And if you need transformational coaching, if you really like the messages you heard here from Dr. Fred, please go to drfred360.com or welcome to humanity.net and see what Fred has to offer for you in his course his books, his podcast, and his amazing presence out there in the world. We are proud members of the Health Podcast Network at healthpodcastnetwork.com. We're produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting. Thank you, Rob. And Mark Cappy Spiesen is our social media ringmaster and our newsletter wrangler. Before we say goodbye, I'll leave you with this quote by Albert Schweitzer. Success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. If you love what you're doing, you will be successful. Anyway, be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico and the inimitable, amazing Dr. Fred Moss, my new friend and colleague, saying Arrivederci from Grass Valley, California. Thank you so much. Beautiful Nevada County. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Dr. Fred Moss, and we will catch you on the proverbial flip side. <laughs>